Hello, everyone. This is the language community close up session. We are here so that you can learn more about this community. Now I will pass it off to our professor. Okay, so um, good afternoon or good evening. My name is uh, Juan um, Uriagareca. I'm a, I'm a linguist. Um, I'm, that means I'm very interested in uh, language um, and specifically um, um, the way language fits into our everyday uh, existence. Um, so um, I, I actually was originally um, a, an economist uh, interested in the natural sciences, but I ended up uh, doing this in part because of love of language and also because of love of science. I think it's it's a great uh, uh, tool for us to 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 analyze reality. Um, so in this um, uh, moment, uh, most of my time is dedicated to uh, research, and uh, you know I, I I have graduate classes and 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 so on. But I um, have continued to teach undergraduate classes because I really love interacting with uh, people um, my kids age uh, that's what keeps me going and uh, you know I feel that sometimes the same questions I get over dinner I get in the classroom and that is uh, lots of fun um, I like hard questions uh, I think society progresses through asking difficult questions about uh, where we are and and uh, where we want to be and I think uh, language is um, uh, one of the best ways to focus our efforts uh, in that uh, in that uh, regard. This uh, slide has uh, some of my recent publications. Uh, actually, the book that is uh, presented there as forthcoming is has has been out for about a month or so. Uh, so uh, you're welcome to take a look. And um, um, you know, there's other work that I keep doing in the same along the same lines. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so in the class, um, um, I actually teach two versions of this class uh, that are uh, tightly related. One is uh, more of a STEM version, uh, which I call the biophysics of language. And then there's another uh, more uh, humanities version, which I call uh, mythology of the oppressed. Um, in that one, which is uh, this iteration is going to be the humanities version, um, I am asking the question, the big question is whether information drives human history. Um, to some extent, the answer is an obvious yes. Uh, the real question is, well, exactly how and how does that affect who we are and how we uh, build our stories and so on. But the, the real nuance starts appearing when you uh, dig down to 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 answering that in 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 full detail. Like uh, for example, nowadays, of course, we are using a medium like this to convey uh, this information that we're exchanging. But before we had anything like this, I didn't grow up with anything like this, as you can imagine. Before we had this, we had a, a series of other things. You know, telephone. I did grow up uh, with telephone and so on. But you, you keep going, and there's a point where you. People didn't grow up with the printing press, or people didn't grow up with, uh, uh, believe it or not, there were no writing systems. Those were invented in the last 5,000 years. And you, as you keep going further back in history, um, there's a moment in our evolution where language itself became the, the kind of reality that it is. That was in, invented or discovered uh, you know, maybe a couple of hundred thousand years ago, back in the Paleolithic when we were living somewhere in the middle of uh, Africa. Um, but if you if you go from there, a couple of hundred thousand years ago, all the way up to today, and let alone what will hopefully happen tomorrow, you see that there is a trajectory where language morphs in in ways uh, in which technology uh, plays a role, and so on. So that's. Um, that's what we look at here, and and because of course, five thousand years ago there were barely were writing systems. You have to look at other forms of recording, which is typically going to be myths. Myths are ways of conveying from one generation to another what we think about ourselves, uh, who we are in the midst of our history, and so on. 
Um, and that's that's the tweak in, in, in this class. We look at mythology from all the various uh, perspectives that you can use to answer such a big question. Uh, it is fascinating, actually, how many of the myths recur. Uh, some of them are obvious, like the myth of, of, of the flood, for example. It appears in, in, in virtually all cultures. So is that a reflex of some event? Is that a reflex of how we think about uh, catastrophes? Is that a metaphor of something else? Those kinds of questions uh, emerge constantly. Um, let me go to the next one because I want to talk a little bit. Well, this is just a picture where we were downtown looking at some of those early images, right? Those th those kinds of images of, uh, of course, this is a reproduction downtown in, in a wonderful museum um, where um, one of our colleagues in, in the Smithsonian Institution recreated the scenery. But what you see there, those kinds of hand prints, they're all over in, in all continents, but Antarctica. I have no idea whether Antarctica, if 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 if, if the, God forbid the, the ice melts, whether we will find them there too. I suspect not because it was covered in ice. But everywhere else, wherever there is a, a wall, there is impressions like this. Um, and you know, there's many other types of impressions as well. Anyway, so that's that picture. But let me let me keep advancing. And these are just pictures of when we started in the summer getting together. Um, I, I, I wanted to say uh, one more thing. Uh, so this is a round table where we were talking last year, I think it was, uh, with our colleagues and students and, and professors. We were in that particular instance having a big uh, get together about uh, environmental issues and, and uh, what uh, our approaches can uh, tell us about such a survival question that we are facing right now. Um, and this is actually a good moment to emphasize why I call this of the oppressed. Um, there's a sense in which we are such um, quote unquote weak creatures within nature, right? If you if you look at a storm, if you look at a tree falling, you, you realize how small you are in the midst of all of this. So nature can be quite impressive. Many of those cave uh, paintings that I was alluding to present I don't know, uh, mammoths or rhinoceros, and you can see how fierce and big those animals are as compared to us. So uh, nature itself can be can seem oppressive, although we have used intelligence and language to uh, have a dialogue with nature, which hasn't always been all successful, either for us or for nature, as we're seeing uh, right now. But things also get interesting when we start oppressing one another, which uh, is a very interesting question. When do we start doing that? I mean, what type of structures lead us to do that? And is that a necessary property of our history or can we find ways to cooperate with one another so that we come up with answers to the big uh, foundational questions that we face every generation? Anyway, so that's what that uh, round table there shows you. Let's see what else do we have here. And this is now a perfect segue to uh, Maya who um, uh, can introduce herself. <laughs> Alrighty, hello everyone. My name is Maya Dunchak and I'm a current junior. So that means I took this class when I was a freshman. And unfortunately, that means I did take it virtually, but um, even virtually, it was a great experience. Um, I'm currently a accounting and international business double major with a Spanish minor. Um, so I didn't really end up doing anything with ling linguistics, but um, that is part of the reason I chose this class. Um, when originally when I was looking at all of the Carolan cohorts to choose from, I chose this one thinking it was going to be like a foreign language focused class. And I ended up taking the biophysics of language one. And I, it was an excellent class. It taught me it's been so helpful, but I was thrown for such a loop. I am not a science major, but um, the research skills and that research project we did has been invaluable. I've had to write research papers in basically every class I've taken, at least like one or two a semester. And I do still go back to what we learned in freshman year, some of those like the little forms on like how to use the library, how to write bibliography. Like I go back and look at them just to refresh because I'm like, okay, I remember being super helpful when I first took this class, um, I'm still doing this. So let me see, um, yes, but I was virtual. Um, but now I know, especially through talking with other Carolan students and other language kids, that um, it's even more fun in person. Um, I really wish I would have been able to take this one. I would have taken this again, to be honest. I know I've taken it, but I think this other version sounds super cool. Um, and besides that, besides my educational takeaway, of course, which was um, learning how to write research papers and how to work together, um, 
I feel like college projects are a lot different than high school ones. There's still a lot of hand holding, I feel like, and they're a little bit less open. Whereas this is truly the first class where it's like, hey, here's a broad theme and you can really do whatever you want. And that kind of freedom at first is scary because there's no defined rules. The teacher isn't like, here's six things, you're group four, so you do topic four. Um, but it really prepares you for the rest of your courses, especially if you do in a, a STEM major, humanities major, um, where teachers give you, like I have a Spanish project currently, and it's just write about something that we've learned about so far. And that is as broad as you can get. But thanks to class like this, you know, I know how to start, I know how to research, and I have the tools to start working on that, and I am not overwhelmed. Um, but outside of school, Carillon really helps me make my first friends, and I know that's a big concern for a lot of incoming freshmen is how am I going to make friends in this big university. Um, and joining a program like Carillon is a great way to do that. Um, obviously, the language kids are awesome, so I plug the language cohort, but um, really any of the Carillon ones are is a good way to meet like a smaller group of people and you'll stick with them. So they're not like temporary friends that you'll meet at if you're a transfer student, like some transfer events, or you know, you meet them in the dining hall one day and you're like, oh, they're cool. Um, and you do get to live with the kids in your cohort, cohort too. Um, I didn't get to do that, but had I been in person, I would have lived with other language kids. So we could go to class together, we could talk about the projects after. Um, yeah, overall it was a really great experience and I highly recommend it, especially if you love myths, which I do. Um, and then if not, consider classics because that was just as cool. <laughs> I, I wanna, can, can I make a couple of uh, quick comments because Maya touched on two hugely important issues that I think uh, should be emphasized. Uh, first that, um, Look, we are we are a huge community, right? We are forty thousand people, fifty thousand if we count everybody together. And so, as a as a parent with kids in college right now, exactly what Maya said is my worry. I mean, so who who are going to be the friends? Who is who is going to make that into a little village, not just a big city? And it is precisely living learning communities that can help you do that because then you have a focus group, you have a group of uh, folks that you can, you know, you could keep uh, talking to one another and you can also talk to us professors as, as part of, this is part of what we commit to by doing this. So that's a hugely important issue. Second point that uh, Maya touched upon is that we want to give you tools that the university provides it, it, it's a privilege to have a wonderful library. It's a privilege to have professors and colleagues all over the place. So we want to be able to tell you, look, this isn't, um, you know, a, something that is outside of your reach. It is here for you. And it, it, it does, it is true that it's sometimes scary because the questions we face as a society are big and, and scary. It's not like we have a recipe to answer them, but with ingenuity, with one another, with serious collaborative work, we can make progress in addressing some of these big questions. So this type of class is a way to just say, hey, uh, it may sound intimidating, but we are here for one another. And if we work together, we really can make a difference. And it doesn't ultimately matter whether you follow this path or that path. All of those are intellectual paths that are worth uh, your effort, and we're here to help you. Um, one last thing briefly, I will say this is probably the first class that truly taught me to like think. I know a big um, complaint that my parents have, well, complaint, is that we don't think. Like my siblings and I, if I have a problem, first thing I'm going to do, I'm like, oh, I will find that for you. Give me 30 seconds and I'll have you an answer. And they were like, but if you thought about it, you could have had the answer in five seconds. Um, so this is really the first one. Since there are no right or wrong answers, um, which is scary, I will not lie. <laughs> it's hard when there's no strict rules and um, it was really good. And especially since um, if you came from, I'm from Howard County, so if you come from any of the schools like that, then you kind of know. It's just a really challenging class, but it's really good. And it, I think, not to be cheesy, but besides like personal growth, there's a lot of academic growth too, so. I don't know, Jillian, if you uh, need anything else from us or this is a good um, uh, place. I don't know if you have other questions.